Hello, welcome back to the faculty series of AP Daily. I'm Jody Eastberg. And I'm Tim Kern. And you might remember us from the very first episode in this series where Tim and I kicked off the faculty lecture series. I serve as chief reader for AP World History and Tim was the former chief reader of World History. So this is a subject that is near and dear to our hearts. I teach world history at Alverno College and Tim is at Cal State Long Beach. And today we're, we're gonna wrap things up for the course. Uh, Tim's gonna talk more about unit nine on globalization and give you some really great insights and in how to approach that material. And I'm here basically just to be a cheerleader to say good luck and uh, to send you on your way. So, contemporary globalization in world history. So unit nine really focuses on that theme of globalization. And as you've been learning along the way through these uh, faculty series and also through the other AP uh, daily materials, world historians are interested in global history. And so at this point in the semester or this point in the year, I'm wondering, as you think about everything that you've learned, how have you developed your thinking as a world historical thinker? So this is the time of the year for you to kind of take a step back, think in the global perspective here about your learning, but then also about world history. And how have you thought, how do you think differently now about the world? As you consider the contemporary world, is the globe or the world coming into focus in a different way? And I think when uh, Tim goes into his lecture about globalization, there's so many things happening in our contemporary context that clearly relate to this material. And I think now our hope is that you can really think about the world as world historians. And then finally, what skills have you developed to interrogate sources, points of view, context, different types of media, data, primary and secondary sources? How have you really learned how to use those documents and to use the primary evidence that historians use as world historians? So I'm really hoping that um, now having gone through the class that you have this new global perspective that you're taking not only to your course material but also to the content. And I'm just gonna hand it off to Tim now to give us a deep dive into globalization. Thank you, Jody. Welcome everybody. Um, just to kind of give you a reminder about our framing, uh, when we started this series, we talked about world historians looking at uh, connectivity in history across large spaces and across nations and civilizations. We said to keep an eye on trade, migration, uh, state building, empire, information and communication technologies. And I want you to keep those themes in mind uh, as we go through and think about um, the history of globalization in a contemporary context. So right off the bat, we, we, we wanna think about the term globalization in terms of uh, what's in a term, as I say here. Um, I'm not gonna read this to you, but if you look on the left, um, the International Monetary Fund's definition of globalization refers to the growing interdependence of countries, blah, 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 since the mid 1980s. In other words, the definition is that globalization is something uh, contemporary. But if you look at the introduction to the Yale Global uh, website, globalization is a relatively new term used to describe a very old process, right? This is a, a historical one. And hopefully you've seen through the course that globalization is not something new. Um, it's actually something that's been around throughout most of the human experience. And yet there is something distinctive about the contemporary period, right? And what I'm gonna be talking a lot about is the shrinking of what's called the time-space continuum, right? how things come together uh, synchronously and with immediacy over great expanses of space. And that is something that is, is uh, relative, very recent in the human experience. And I always like to use this sort of uh, a marker, right? That, that yes, there was globalization, the bow and arrow spread to every uh, continent bar Australia, uh, every culture uh, in the Paleolithic period, but it took what, 15,000, 25,000, 10,000 BCE to accomplish that agriculture spread across the, uh, the world, uh, but it took about 9,000 years to accomplish that. Machinofacture, what we might call industrialization, work in factories, started in England in the late 18th century. And it took about 100 years for industrialization and machinofacture to be taking place on every continent. 
But if we think about contemporary globalization, I point to the 2G commercial cell phone, which was invented in uh, Finland in 1991. Uh, within uh, five years, there were cell phone towers in every country in the world. And within, by 1997, within six years, uh, the use of mobile phones or cellular phones had outstripped uh, the use of landlines. You get my point, right? The globalization of the present is distinctive because of just its intensity and its ability to shrink the time space continuum. And the last thing, before we really dig into globalization in a contemporary sense, I want you to also recognize that globalization has, has not been linear. It's not this sort of story where each year we become more global. It may seem like that from the um, perspective of the present, but if we think about the long 20th century, there's a case to be made, uh, and I would argue that the world in fact was far more global between 1870 to 1914, um, part of world history that you've already studied um, than it was from 1914 to 1980, right? And if you think about those um, frames that I talked about in our first lecture, um, new information and communication technologies, 1870 to 1914, telegraph, the first synchronous mechanism where one could communicate farther than one could yell, right? Uh, was invented, you had the telephone, you had new transportation technologies, in particular, cargo refri uh, refrigeration, uh, the internal combustion engine. You had this massive economic boom uh, with the second industrial revolution, which globalized the world economy through the mass consumption and production in the Northern hemisphere, raw materials generally in the South. You had the largest percentage of, of um, individuals moving and migrating during this period, another mechanism of connectivity across the globe. And of course, it was also the high watermark of imperialism. But for most of the 20th century, from 1914 to 1980, you see sort of a, a disconnection, right? There's less connectivity, less globalization, if you like. Fewer information, communication, technological breakthroughs, slower economic growth with the depression and recessions, protectionism uh, during the 1920s and the 1930s, um, anti-immigrant laws uh, beginning in the 1920s, a, a significant decline in, in global migration, uh, the weakening of empires as an integrating structure uh, in the world. And of course, the Cold War, as we'll talk more about, um, also divided the world rather than connected it. So the world we live in today looks in many ways more like the world from uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And I'm just going to kind of walk you through this. This is a measure of the value of exported goods as a percentage of all wealth created in an economy. Right, meaning that your economy is connected through trade and trade is significant for the growth of your economy. You can see a, a distinctive uptick in that period, right? The late 19th century, a decline for most of the 20th century, and then this rapid increase, right? Since 1980. And I'm gonna be using sort of 1970, 1980 as my starting point in terms of what I'm defining as contemporary. And this chart also a little, a little, a little wonky, I don't wanna get into the data, but it's basically measuring um, financial integration, the integration of capital markets much higher around 1900 and growing again, right, in, in the 1990s. Uh, trade as a percentage of growth in the economy, also uptick, and then international migration, very high in the early 20th century, very high in the late 20th century, declining through most of the 20th century. My point has been made. So then, um, Another way to look at this is the expansion of transnational trade and integration sort of visually, right? And this is the percentage of GDP generated by overseas trade, if you like. And you can see there's been a massive change between 1950 and 2017. All of the world is more connected and more reliant, right? On international trade than it was um, in the middle of the 20th century. And we've also witnessed in the late 20th century, uh, the global integration of capital and product markets, right? Investment markets and also production markets, the stuff that's produced and manufactured, things that are tactile and services and where they're consumed, right? So this global integration of production and capitalization and investment, right? Is at an unprecedented level today um, in the early uh, 21st century? And it's really much associated with the integration of capital markets and um, exchange markets. 
And it's been facilitated by a number of things that we're gonna go into in, in some detail, but it's been facilitated also by multinational transnational corporate structures where companies are increasingly uh, transnational or multinational in the way that they're structured. 50% of all the world's manufactured goods today are produced by companies that are multinational as opposed to uh, single nation uh, corporations. And here's this foreign assets to global GDP, right? It's just astronomic in the contemporary period. Um, reached a peak in 1914 where 20% of all wealth being produced in the world came from in any national economy was produced by investment from without that economy, but that's increased today to about 80%. And there we can, we see in the middle of the 20th century, a less integrated uh, capital market. So how are we gonna explain the origins of contemporary globalization? And I thought this was a wonderful image of contemporary globalization. This is an Urdu school uh, in Mumbai where this child in COVID times is learning on the internet through a cellular uh, communication on his mobile phone, which gives you a, a really good connection to the uh, time-space continuum. But in any event, um, the things I'm gonna address are the information and communication technologies revolution, sometimes referred to the ICT revolution, uh, look at new efficiencies in transportation, which have um, um, supported uh, the intensity of globalization, the Cold War, I know you said, I said, I know I said the Cold War divided the world, it did, but the Cold War also connected the world and the end of the Cold War um, really facilitated the rapid globalization that we've experienced in contemporary times. I'm also gonna talk about deindustrialization and post-industrialization and how they've played a role in globalization. And lastly, how global migration is also a significant feature. So the ICT revolution flattens the globe, right? All these new technologies revolving around information and communication are hugely important, right? In terms of the synchronous spontaneity of communication across uh, the world, across nations, across regions, right? And here we have an image, um, I believe this is Alexandria in India, or excuse me, Egypt, right? Uh, where everybody's got their uh, satellite TVs, uh, no doubt watching Mo Salah for Liverpool, that's a soccer reference. Uh, and that's, I think you saw this from the first lecture. I, I keep showing you my first computer. Uh, that was my first compact computer um, back to the 1980s. That's uh, where I say mine was an Apple II GS. We did okay. the exact same thing last time. Okay. Oh, Jody, I thought you were just a child then, but uh, any event. Just at the beginning of the globalization, contemporary the globalization process. <laughs> So any event, that, that's the, my compact computer, which look, came in a, like a sewing machine box, it looked like. Talking about the ICT revolution then, so what were the key elements that contributed to the information communication technology revolution? Um, first, I would like to say many of these the technologies uh, developed during the Cold War, but their use was uh, for military application. And when these technologies became revolutionary in their importance is when they became commercialized at the end of the 20th century. So some of the things that are significant then in the ICT revolution is the commercialization of satellite communication, which began in the late 1960s for television, um, the personal computer and the internet in the 1980s, um, the invention, if you like, or the commercialization of mobile phones and the transition from analog to cellular mobile communication, which really took off in the 1990s. And then something that's often forgotten is the significance of SIM cards and pay-as-you-go technologies, which meant that people could um, use cellular phones, access the internet uh, without having to pay a, a monthly fee that, you know, an internet a bill that's sent to them um, by email or whatever, right? The notion that you could pay as you go, right? To gain access uh, to the internet and to cellular communication. If you look at this graph or this chart, you can see how significant the increase is in all these um, um, technologies and, and dating them again to the end of the 20th century. Again, this, that data is, is US. Here we just see the dramatic in, increase in the uh, global use of the internet. Um, again, it's a global phenomena, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there's a digital divide uh, as you can see, uh, the share of the population using the internet has increased dramatically. Um, again, it's a global phenomena, but most prevalent 
uh, in the West and Asia. And then this is the, gives you again a sense of change, right? In 1990, virtually no one had access to the internet um, on the basis of having consistent access over a three month period, that's where the data source. Uh, but by 2017, you can see there's this massive expansion of the shares of the population. And some in Canada, it's near 100%, United States, uh, well over 80%, uh, China, Russia, et cetera. You do see then though the digital divide, once again, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, digital access is considerably lower um, than other parts of the world, but nonetheless significantly increased um, over the last decade or so. And then the expansion of cellular mobile communication, uh, another huge shift in flattening the time-space continuum. You can see again from 1995 to 2017, there's been a massive increase in the number of people with um, cellular uh, phone subscriptions. And that underestimates the impact in the developing world where much of the access to both uh, cellular communication by phone and access to the internet actually comes through the mobile phone through a pay-as-you-go uh, SIM card. So if you take China and India, for example, they have the world's largest number of internet users. The majority of folks in India and China access the internet by phone. And you can see this data, which comes from India, right? In 2000, those people that did have access to the internet did so by their computer. Uh, by 2019, 60% of Indians are internet, accessing the internet by mobile phone, and most of them with a pay-as-you-go uh, SIM card. It's, it's sort of, if you like, democratizing access to the internet through the phone and the pay-as-you-go SIM card. And it's also interesting how places like India and the developing world sort of skipped in terms of development, right, went from the landline phone and then to the mobile phone and mobile internet connection or cellular internet connection without ever going through the intermediary period of creating fiber optic cable and all that sort of stuff that connects um, people's computers to the internet uh, in the developed world. The, and then the mobile phone and the, its connection to the internet has just created all sorts of new um, synchronous types of activities, mobile banking, uh, not known to any great degree in the United States, but much of the world, people use mobile money accounts as opposed to traditional banking services. And it's created much greater access to credit um, through the use of mobile um, money accounts. And then if you look here, even in the United States, more and more people are moving towards accessing the internet through their mobile phone, as opposed to their desktop, desktop and uh, laptop. Uh, you can see how much time we spend fittering away on Facebook or whatever that might be, but you get my point, right? Going to school. And going to, going to school. school, exactly. Um, transportation revolutions, hugely important as well in terms of globalizing the world and our contemporary globalization. The key thing here is the creation of containerized shipping. C containerized shipping had been around for a long time, but the key point here was an international standard that was created in the late 1960s, um, which meant that these um, containers could be moved from one national economy to another because the standard of size was the same. And today, 95% of all, of all non-bulk cargo uh, are transported in traders, traded in containers on ships, rail, and truck. And the um, intermodality uh, of transportation from those three areas is relatively seamless. Right? And we see there um, the largest container vessel in the world, which is the OOCL Hong Kong, which was built by Samsung Industries in South Korea, the same folks that build um, cell phones. If you try to think about the scale, that ship is 100, it's like a football field in width and 20 stories in height. It, takes, it took, uh, a, this is a pic, it came to my city in Long Beach, California, it took 15 days to come from China, it took three days to unload it. Uh, you can just see the, the efficiencies of moving so much stuff, almost all Chinese uh, manufactured goods coming from China to the Pacific coast. Airline deregulation, also hugely important. Um, since the late 1970s, uh, with deregulation, uh, airfares went declined, aircraft became more efficient, right? And passenger and freight volume uh, has increased dramatically. The movement of both goods and people by air at least before COVID, 
uh, has increased quite dramatically. On the left, you see the massive increase in air, airline traffic and aviation efficiency measured in the decline of uh, CO2 uh, emitted, though still a polluter. Um, and then if you look on the right, we see the dramatic decline in transportation and communication costs. It says relative to 1930, but I pulled the data from 1960. So you can see again, at the end of the 20th century, there's a sort of revolutionary uh, impact in terms of lowering the cost of moving goods. Another thing which contributed to globalization though is also uh, in the realm of ideas, neoliberalism, which is in your curriculum. Um, neoliberalism is associated with a movement at the end of the war, right, to create uh, international agreements that would uh, support economic development and liberalize trade. And by liberalized trade, meaning opening up trade between nations and also um, providing support for investment. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, which was formerly known as the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. These things you've probably studied. But the point being is that all these, these institutions aim to create um, global development and a global economy. Um, but what's really significant is the, um, the growth or resurgence of neoliberal economic ideas in the 1970s and 1980s, which advocated free market capitalism, deregulation, privatization, and globalization. These neoliberal ideas also became embedded in these institutions um, through the sort of economic clout, if you like, of the United States. And it was the neoliberal thinking that became preeminent in the United States, um, which ensured that these institutions became increasingly neoliberal. And it was also associated with other sort of neoliberal tendencies, which was to create free trade zones, such as the European Union, ASEAN and Southeast Asia, NAFTA uh, in North America. And importantly, these neoliberal ideas, rightly or wrongly, I don't wanna get into that argument, but they've been represented as being uh, one of the reasons why uh, the Soviet uh, uh, communism and the Soviet Union failed in the Cold War and the kudos was sort of given to neoliberalism through its association with the United States, which then obviously promoted neoliberal ideas that much more. And I should mention there that neoliberalism was very much a, a response in the West uh, to the declining capacity of its industrial economies in the 1960s and 1970s. So the Cold War, then the Cold War, as I mentioned, did disconnect the world, divided much of it into two camps an Eastern, on an Eastern and Western axis. But the Cold War then also created economic isolation between Soviet and United US economic spheres of interest. And their economic spheres of interest were uh, evolved around very different economic philosophies in the case of the Soviet Union around planning, right? And a planned economy in the United States over uh, commercial or market economies. And that's an image of uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan chasing after his dog. Um, and they were both uh, obviously very much associated uh, with a, a resurgence of in, the, in the 1980s of neoliberal um, thinking. But the Cold War also connected the world, something that people forget. I already mentioned, right, about the impact of Cold War technologies. But we also have to think about the fact that during the Cold War, particularly in the 1970s and the 1980s, right, the United States essentially sold itself as an empire of liberty. The Soviet Union sold itself as an empire of social justice to all these new nations that were being created after the end of imperialism, right? The influence of the United States and the Soviet Union in the developing world in what some call the global South was much more uh, extensive after the end of empire as opposed to during the process of ending empire. In other words, working with these new post-colonial states and offering them uh, with strings attached, right? Different models of economic development, right? Uh, one based on planning and another placed on uh, market incentives. In doing so, they created um, economic connect connections within their, their spheres that were on a north-south axis, right? Uh, admittedly, the east-west axis was divided by the Cold War, but what I'm trying to make the case is that through this mechanism, right, economic connectivity was created between the northern hemisphere and the southern. And then the Cold War ended, and then we see the sort of breakdown of that east-west barrier. And that's an image of uh, everyone trying to dry their uh, Trabants from East Germany into West Germany uh, in 1989. Uh, not much variation in the model, uh, but you, you appear you could get different colors of the Trabant. 
So this another factor in leading to globalization that is deindustrialization, post-industrialization, uh, which takes place in the late 20th century and is also part of the curriculum of Unit 9. So during this period, we see a massive expansion of manufacturing outside of the West, initially in the Pacific Rim and then in other parts of the developing world. And it was very much associated with the outsourcing of industry out of the West and the deindustrialization of the West. Why did this happen in a larger um, context, right? Industries were seeking lower wage environments and less environmental regulation um, because in the 1970s, we see the rise of environmental regulations um, uh, in, the, uh, in the West. Um, cheaper transportation costs facilitated this, right? The movement of production far away because it didn't cost so much to bring the goods back. Um, increasingly, precision machine tool engineering. Uh, this is very important, like Apple. A lot of folks think that Apple phones are made in China because labor is cheap. Apple phones are made in China also because uh, the Chinese are very good at precision machine tool engineering. You can imagine with such a small instrument as an Apple phone, right? And so those, those industries were also developing very rapidly in other parts uh, of the world. Another thing which facilitated uh, deindustrialization and the expansion of manufacturing in other parts of the world, synchronous commercial and financial communication with those new technologies, and then the liberalization of trade and investment, right? Where capital and trade, um, foreign investment could take place um, in national economies. And that's an image of deindustrialization, uh, the Firestone tire plant uh, in England. So industrial example in the Pacific Rim, the Japanese economic miracle in the 1960s and 70s sort of began uh, the growth of the Pacific Rim with growth in automobiles, electronics, steel, chemical manufacturing. Other nations followed suit, if you like, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. And at the end of the, later in the 20th century, the growth of Japan and these other uh, Pacific Rim economies was uh, completely eclipsed by the unprecedented industrial growth of China in the late 20th century. Something else um, that you're studying in, in unit nine. But this growth of the Chinese economy is very much associated with the reforms of Deng Xiaoping that are associated with uh, detente with the United States in the 1970s, um, decollectivization of agriculture, opening the economy to foreign investment, initially in special administration zones like in Shenzhen, uh, privatization and entrepreneurship, and it's important to note that in communist China today, still a communist nation, 40% uh, of its economy, only 40% only of its economy is now um, state owned. And this just shows you the rapid expansion of the economy of Japan, mostly in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And that's an image of the Toyota Corolla coming off the assembly line in 1968. It was the 100th car made within a single month to just give you an idea of how efficient car making was in Japan. And in 1968, the Corolla, Toyota Corolla was the world's most popular car. And then you see China's growth even much greater in terms of uh, the, the, the speed of growth and the quantity of growth, uh, but also in terms of chronology in our contemporary time frame, right? Taking place later uh, after um, the Japanese miracle. And that's a picture of Deng Xiaoping, uh, actually when he was visiting uh, the United States, I, I assume he was in some place, I think he was in Texas. But we also have other emerging industrial economies, right? That are growing very, very quickly as well outside the Pacific Rim. And this gives you a sense, if you look at this graph, China, India, South Korea, Turkey, Brazil, these are also emerging industrial economies. And this is just some data that kind of facilitates that, right? Today, the fastest growing uh, economy for commercial aircraft production is in fact, Brazil with the Embraer, um, uh, commercial jetliner, and the fastest rising manufacturing economies, meaning in percentage increase since uh, 2013 were Vietnam, Turkey, Poland, India, and Brazil. So this movement of industrialization and the expansion of manufacturing um, outside the West is incre increased beyond the Pacific Rim. And this leads us to another thing, right? A notion of a third industrial revolution, right? That this period of rapid globalization is also associated with automation, right? Um, the fact that, and it's seen clearly in the United States, right? The fact that the United States over the last 10 years or before COVID 
had been increasing its manufacturing exports and production by about 2% per year. We still produce almost as many manufactured goods as China, but there's been tremendous job losses in manufacturing and that's very much associated with automation and outsourcing. And this is taking place in emerging economies as well. For example, there's an image here of a, a chip making factor, a chip making production in China, where the Chinese economy, where we used to make chips, now these chips are making, mostly made in China. Um, and there's outsourcing from China to places like uh, Malaysia for um, um, less uh, sophisticated uh, finished goods. And this is, again, why does this happen? Because markets are open and capital and international investment can flow without prejudice from one economy to the other in the main. And all this is showing you is how few people are working in manufacturing and how there's been this rapid decline in a country like Japan and in a country like the United States. And if you looked at this similar thing for China, China's probably right now sort of at its peak, but even in China now there's this movement down where increasingly more of the Chinese economy is uh, generated by people employed in the services, not manufacturing. And then automation is a global phenomenon, right? And here we see um, an image of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine plant in Pune in Maharashtra in India, where they're producing a, a vaccine called COVID Shield. That's the Indian labeling of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And as you can see there, it's one guy who's looking through a window and there's masses of vials of vaccines that are be pr being produced under um, the processes of automation. Uh, just to give you a sense of the global nature and things of how things have spread, uh, this is being produced by the Serum Institute of India, which is in fact the world's largest, oops, type of their two largest uh, vaccine manufacturer in the world. And six Indian um, um, firms produce 60% of all the world's vaccine, uh, just to give you a sense of the, the spread of these um, industries. And in fact, India is about to start its own vaccine called COVID, Covaxin, and they plan to have 300 million people vaccinated uh, by July. Anyway, deindustrialization then is associated with the movement of industry out of the West um, and then being replaced, if you like, by economies that are mo more focused on services, knowledge, and data, right? And when I, this is an image actually of, of India of, uh, in Mumbai or what was Bombay, right? And deindustrialization is a, is a process there. It, it's quite complicated, right? Those are actually cotton textile mills that were built in Mumbai at the end of the um, 19th century and continued uh, through the interwar period. But you had a, a declining industrial base in those types of industries in India, just like you did um, in the United States and in Great Britain and other parts of the world. So anyway, this movement towards service sector in post-industrial economies, uh, it relates to the increasing significance of financial and commercial services and information technologies and innovation, right, in global economic growth. And it's also associated with the very contemporary rise and global impact of initially Western, but increasingly also Asian and global big tech and big data firms. Firms that collect data, store data, structure data, analyze data, and they do so with new technologies and increasingly with uh, artificial intelligence, right? Talk about shrinking the time space continuum. Just to give you a sense of big data, uh, big data, right? Meaning every like email, every time you, you look something up on Facebook, every time you post a photograph, that's a bit of data, right? That data grows 40% every year. In 2008, uh, the, the sum volume of global um, data was one-tenth of one zettabyte. Bet you haven't heard of a zettabyte. I hadn't either. Zettabyte has a lot of zeros attached to it, right? It's a lot of bytes, right? But just look at how that's grown, right? To 47 zettabytes currently in 2020, projected to be 180 zettabytes by 2020. This massive increase um, in data. And the, the velocity of data, it's not just a large quantity, but the quickness in which it moves and is created in one minute in 2019, on average, 3.8 million Google searches, 156 emails are sent, 243,000 Facebook photos were uploaded. Just to give you a sense of the significance of this and how it's associated with our globalized world. And it's created what we would call weightless economies, right? Or distanceless economies, right? And these distanced globalized economies are easy to outsource, right? You can send this anywhere. 
And what you have there is an image of a call center uh, in Bangalore, uh, in India, right? Which is a call center for uh, credit cards or whatever it might be, right? But there's no reason why the call center because of these technologies has to be literally uh, where those services are produced. And services now are also being automated, right? So the autom automization of services is moving, uh, hence like the automization of manufacturing to the point that if we're gonna have a fourth industrial revolution, many have argued that 3D manufacturing is just that, right? This sort of notion that it's someday, probably not in my lifetime, but maybe yours, right? They'll, you'll literally have a 3D printer at home and you'll just simply type in what it is you want and the 3D printer will create it. In other words, the knowledge and value that goes into that process will be through, again, technology and um, innovation and something that'll be global and phenomenal. And lastly, in terms of impacting um, globalization, remember one of our themes, migration, right? Uh, the late 20th century has is, is witnessed another significant increase in global migration, not to the same extent as the late 19th century in percentage terms, but very large number. Nonetheless, it's associated with the third demographic transition of the late 20th century, where in fact, we now see declining birth and death rates. Initially, it was declining death rates, but now globally, with the exception of South Sub-Saharan Africa, um, this transition has meant that the, there's a global slowdown in the annual growth of the world's population. Um, that said, right, we, there's more open migration and labor laws. Uh, like an example would be the Immigration Act in 1965 in the United States, right, where the flow of labor across uh, national boundaries is freer and easier because of uh, cheaper transporta transregional transportation. So the number of foreign born as a percentage of the total population in 2010 is the largest it's ever been in the world since before the First World War, right? And again, migration is another thing that connects uh, peoples and places, societies, and parts of the world. And there's also a significant amount of rural to urban migration going on, particularly in China. Now here, what this is simply showing us, right? And on the left, it's showing us that um, these population numbers are stabilizing uh, in Africa. That's, this is projected in 2050, Africa be, is going to continue to grow relative to other parts of the world. But what we see on the right is net migration, right? The number of immigrants relevant to the number of emigrants. And you can see the movement here um, is from south to north, right? Traditionally, the, the axis of migration was east to west, but increasingly uh, in the late 20th century, it's a north-south migration. So what, what are the consequences of globalization? Oh, there's jillions of them. I'm only gonna talk about a couple. One is biological, right? The spread of invasive species and the decline of biodiversity is a consequence of the Connecticut connectivity of the planet uh, in the early 21st century. We have Atlantic salmon that now swim in the Pacific because they escape their fish farms. And we have Pacific salmon that now swim in the Atlantic because they also escape their fish farms. And the, the salmon, if they hadn't escaped their fish farms, would be being flown to markets all over the world um, by aircraft. We have the infamous murder hornets, if you haven't read about those, uh, which came from uh, Asia, probably by aircraft, and are now in the Northwestern United States. Kudzo, I was trying to think of a plant that you could relate to, uh, uh, is an invasive species all over the Southern United States, that big viney stuff that grows all over the, the place. Uh, it's a, a more, ancient origin in terms of being invasive species, but it's a good example of an invasive species. And of course, pandemic diseases, uh, which we're living within the COVID pandemic right now, um, but we have the HID, HIV pandemic, the avian bird flu, uh, Ebola, right? The notion that pandemics are going to be, um, unfortunately, easier uh, to disseminate because of, again, um, the, the complete shrink and collapse of the time-space continuum. Then we have contemporary glo uh, cultural globalization, lots of examples of this. Um, the notion of the World Cup, right, which is, is the most popular and most viewed sporting event in the world. Uh, international travel, again, pre-COVID, right, was growing at 6% per annum since the 1990s. And increasingly, um, the travelers are not from the West, to other parts of the world, but folks from China and India coming to the West as destinations, right? Where global travel 
has become much more international and reciprocal. Uh, yoga is another example, yoga coming from India and South Asia, finding itself in the West. And then to some extent, certain aspects of the sort of physical aspects of yoga, finding their way back um, to um, yoga, um, uh, the way yoga is actually practiced in South Asia and yoga studios, which is something that is completely foreign to India until it came back, uh, if you like, from the West, that the notion of a yoga studio. Um, religion, right, the, the spread of Asian religions, Buddhism in particular in Western cultures, um, the spread of Western clothing items, like the baseball cap, uh, the, the global spread of Asian music forms like K-pop and Bhangra from the Punjab. Well, Bhangra, Bhangra is also super, it's sort of hybrid, right? It's from the Punjab, but it's in fact um, uh, practiced and recorded mainly in British, um, British Asian uh, music studios. And then we have these uh, cosmopolitan business elites, right? Um, from all over the world, but generally English speaking and Western university educated. Lastly, what's been the reaction then to cultural globalization? Um, you know, the, the sort of local as it reacts to the global. Um, one thing that's really significant to some extent, it's, it's given um, an impulse, if you like, to artisan productions and things that are distinctive to a particular culture, as opposed to something that's seen as global or Western, right? And of course, these products are then sold online, um, as you see through the, you know, again, the technologies that's associated with globalization. Sports affiliation, many people have commented on how people's affiliation with a team and their national team in particular has become much more intense, is this kind of national, uh, if you like, um, embrace of their sports team uh, relative to living in this uh, increasingly globalized environment. Anti-Americanism and anti-Westernization is, is globalization is often perceived as being something that is in fact American or Western. And that in itself has led right to religious fundamentalism uh, in most of the world religions of the world today. And it's also led to uh, nationalism and populism, right? A rejection of internationalism, which we've seen uh, in the United States, uh, in um, India, uh, and we've seen all, all over the world, right? It's a sort of political reaction globalization. And these are just some examples of sort of hybridity, uh, you know, in India where McDonald's goods are sold through a, a, an Indian uh, lens in terms of what, you know, that's a paneer, it's a cheese sandwich, and then a kind of rejection um, of Coca-Cola. Um, and then lastly, um, the big question then, has globalization made the world uh, more equal or more unequal. One of the arguments for globalization of the neoliberals was that at the end of the day, market forces, et cetera, is going to create economic uh, convergence, right? Where um, economic living standards and economic growth uh, will converge, meaning uh, the developing world will uh, look more like the developed, if you like. And, and the jury's out on that. If you look on the right, it is clear that during the period of globalization, the number of people living in extreme poverty around the world with the, unfortunately, the exception of Sub-Saharan Africa has shrunk pretty precipitously, but that's mostly driven by the data from China where the, um, the incredible expansion of industrialization and manufacturing in China brought lots and lots of people out of uh, rural poverty. But if you look at the left, there's a, it's, it, this is the, uh, the amount of income right, that's uh, owned by the top, per the, the percentage of the economy, right, the economy's wealth that's owned by the top richest 5% of the population. And you can see a very clear trend there in all these different countries, right, the top 5% of income earners are increasingly owning a greater percentage of the nation's wealth, right? And that points, right, to increasing inequality, at least in terms of income that's come out of globalization. And with that, I turn it to Jody. That was a tour de force, Tim. That was an amazing way for us to end um, our lecture series and our conversation on world history. And I think, um, I just kept thinking through the whole presentation, how relevant it is to what's happening now. I am, this is a true story, students, in about one minute, I'm gonna get out of my chair
I'm gonna go get my COVID vaccination. And right, right in that process, I am right in the middle of contemporary globalization and the processes that are so happening that around us. Will not be made in Pune. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so I, I guess the way we wanna end it today is just to say good luck. We are really proud of all the work and all the study that you've done. Um, this is an incredibly relevant field that helps us to understand the world around us today. We started off, you know, in the first unit talking about how historians talk about and write about what they do because they want to be relevant to the present and to the future. And I think we landed in a great spot to really see how all these forces are coming together to impact our lives. So a couple tips for the exam that's coming up in a matter of days, maybe, maybe you're doing this as your last thing right before you take, take the exam. Um, make sure that uh, you make a claim. You saw Tim do that repeatedly in this uh, presentation where he was making multiple claims. Go back, see how he did it. Um, and then make sure you explain your claim. So use evidence, use examples. And uh, if you look at what Tim did, he made a claim and then he had bullet points of examples under each claim that he was making. Make sure you make connections and situate your essay in the bigger context. Uh, here we're talking about globalization and that amazing context of uh, our contemporary world. And then, you know, take the time to do some practice. Uh, you'll, you'll improve with practice, uh, listen to your teachers and write all those essays and you'll be ready uh, to take the exam. So we're, again, we're really proud of you. We know this is another extraordinary year. Um, and uh, I know I'm looking forward to reading your essays and we'll be reading every word of them and uh, seeing where you get your points. And I'm really excited to see what you do with this year's exam. Thank you, everybody. And uh, good luck to you all. And um, I, things are going to get better. Absolutely. Take care. Go get your shot, Jerry. Thanks. <laughs>